Welcome to the History of the Papacy podcast, a podcast about the history of the popes of Rome and Christian Church. Prepare yourself to step behind the ropes and leave the official tour of the story of the popes and Christianity. I'm your host, Steve Guerra, and I thank you for joining me on this journey. This is part two of a multi-part series on the Decapolis of the central Levant region. The last episode, we talked about the cities of the Levant. A few episodes back, we talked about a general overview of the Decapolis and the importance of the Decapolis in the Bible and in the early Christian church. We'll have some speculations and just a good old-fashioned fun talking about these really interesting cities. Now, here's my case that I've been teasing for of the healing of the Hippos demoniac. And this is pure speculation. Hippos is much closer to Jesus's area of activity and his headquarters in the northern Sea of Galilee region than even Gadara is. So I'm talking it's much closer than Jerash or any of that. That whole area is dotted with caves. It isn't like Gadara has a monopoly on caves or anything like that. If Jesus and crew were to jump off of a boat, even with getting caught in a storm, it would have only taken a few hours to get to Hippos then the caves would only have been a short walk from the lake coast or sea coast. Then there's a pretty short run for the pigs to just go into the lake. That is the, those are some major points in favor of Hippos over Gadara. The run to the sea for the pigs would have been quite long. The travel would have been a good solid morning walk from the sea All of that would be much shorter and then would have compressed the timeline a lot to be in hippos. The big evidence against my speculation is that the Gospels say it was in the land of Gadarenes, not in the land of hippos. And so it's really hard to go against what was actually recorded, even if the evidence does point in another direction. Our next stop is the only city of the Decapolis west of the Jordan River, and that is the city of Scythopolis. All of these cities are really important and interesting in their own ways, but Scythopolis is particularly noteworthy for many reasons. Just being the only Decapolis city on the western bank of the Jordan is an interesting point. Scythopolis was a stronghold of Greek and Roman culture right in the middle of Samaria and Galilee. It controlled a pretty large area in a really strategic zone in the southern end of the Levant. It's right near the Jordan River, just south of the Sea of Galilee, only a few miles or kilometers from Pella, another Decapolis city. Scythopolis was on a tell or a hill overlooking a wide, flat area all the way down to the river. I don't know if this is for sure, but by looking at maps, I would make a large wager that someone standing at the top of the tell of Bet Shean or Scythopolis could see Pella pretty easily about seven miles or 11 kilometers away. I'd bet a lot. And when we go on that History of the Papacy Decapolis tour, we're going to verify that. You can see why the area of Scythopolis has been occupied since the beginning of civilization. The Bronze Age civilizations were there. Egyptians controlled for some time, making it a strong frontier outpost. Tons of Canaanite artifacts from the Iron Age have been found there. It's mentioned many times in the Old Testament, and it was originally portioned off to the tribe of Manasseh. Then it was a part of Solomon's kingdom. According to the Book of Kings, the city was destroyed by the Assyrians. But this is not a location that's going to be remain uninhabited for very long. The site was reestablished during Ptolemy II Philadelphus of the Septuagint fame. Then again, this area was in the borderlands between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. 
The name Scythopolis likely comes from a band of Scythian mercenaries fighting for one Greek side or another who wound up settling the region. Bet Sheyan, or Scythopolis, or whatever you want to call it, was eventually taken over by the Seleucids under Antiochus IV Epiphanes. This is the same Seleucid leader who got lumped up by the Romans, persecuted the Jews, and then had the Maccabean Jews revolt on his watch. Those two people are really critical, especially because they were from those two different Greek successor states, and they really defined a large time in this period. It was the Seleucids that made Scythopolis an independent-style Greek city-state. The Hasmoneans would take control of the city and destroy it. The Romans took it back and re-re-maybe re-established it. Like other Decapolis cities, it remained loyal to Rome during the various 1st century AD Jewish revolts. The city of Scythopolis Beth Sheon was very proper, prosperous during Roman and Byzantine times, and it was a really important center for Christianity. Just look at the map makes it really clear why Scythopolis would be such an important location. The Tel and the area around the city were well situated in the east-west and north-south crossroads of the entire southern Levant. If one was in a hurry, you could get from Scythopolis to Caesarea, which was on the coast, a major port on the coast, and likely one hard day's travel. For trading purposes or more leisurely travel, it would still only take a few days max. For trading or more leisurely travel, it would still only take a few days at the maximum. From the sea to the most important trading routes in the east in just a few days, that's key. My guess is that anyone traveling from the Galilee to Jerusalem would have planned to stop off at Scythopolis. Maybe Jesus and or the other apostles walked its streets. Religion, trade, culture, and geography made Scythopolis an incredibly important place on our tour. Let's just head across the banks of the Jordan River to the city of Pella. Pella's story will sound very familiar if you've been listening to these episodes, but it's also really unique. I think that it's one of the main themes of the Decapolis cities. They're, they are independent and in, unique in so many ways, but also share so many cultural and historical ties together. Pella is another ancient city. Habitation in the area goes all the way back to the Stone Age and the dawn of civilization. We're talking about 8,000 years of people living in and around this site. The Egyptians record having a settlement in Pella. Then there's the usual story, fast forward, and we get to the Seleucid times. This was a really important border area between the Seleucid and Ptolemaic Empire of Egypt. The native name for the city would have been something like Pahil, and the name now in Arabic is Tabakat. Fall. Pella was the name of Alexander the Great's hometown back in Macedonia, so you can see why the Greeks renamed the city from Pahil to Pella. And even the modern name of Fall is related. P sounds often move to F sounds. And if you look at P's in Greek, and then a later Arabic town is there, it often has an F instead of the P sound, the F sound, I should say, rather than the P sound. According to Josephus, the town was destroyed by the Hasmoneans, but then rebuilt when the Romans took over. I kind of question this narrative of the Hasmoneans destroying these towns and then these towns all being ready to be rebuilt pretty much immediately when the Romans arrived. I think it could be that the Hasmoneans did destroy some aspects of these cities, pagan temples, maybe Greek-style administrative buildings, but so many of them, entire towns, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. Where did people, particularly the, the Greeks, live? Where did they work? Where did they shop during these downtimes? To me, it seems more likely that the Hasmoneans crushed the local population, and when the Hasmoneans were pushed out, the large and still wealthy Greek population were ready and raring to go to just take things back over again. 
When Pompey conquered the area, as usual, the Greek inhabitants were ready to become a semi-independent Hellenistic Greek city-state again. So long and short, by the first century AD, Pella was an incredibly prosperous city. Being on the Jordan River in close proximity to the other Decapolis cities and on the north-south route from Nebatia to the upper Levant put Pella in a perfect position to grow. I think looking at, the, looking at the map, I think that it would make sense that Pella would have been sort of a depot and a central location for goods from throughout the Decapolis to transit on their way to Mediterranean ports. So I could really see everything moving into Pella, then over to Scythopolis, then Scythopolis on to Caesarea, that really looking... Looking at the map, looking at the geography, that makes perfect sense to me. And I could see that a really great place to stop would be Scythopolis on your way from Caesarea and everything sort of conglomerating on the Mediterranean coast, all these goods moving into Caesarea, and then obviously trade goods from the Mediterranean world to the west going into Caesarea, then Caesarea onto the Scythopolis bump over to Pella, then things can start getting dispersed from there. It's almost like how trade goods are moved to this very day. The location was also key to a major event in the earliest of Christian history, the flight to Pella. Steve here. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, featuring great shows like James Early's Key Battles of American History podcast and many other great shows. Go over to ParthenonPodcast.com to learn more. And here is a quick word from our sponsors. Now here's a little quote. But the people of the church in Jerusalem had been commanded by a revelation, vouchsafed to approved men there before the war, to leave the city and to dwell in a certain town of Perea called Pella. And when those that believed in Christ had come there from Jerusalem, then, as if the royal city of the Jews and the whole land of Judea were entirely destitute of holy men, the judgment of God at length overtook those who had committed such outrages against Christ and his apostles and totally destroyed that generation of impious men. Eusebius, Church History, Book 3, Chapter 5. Here's the short story of the flight to Pella. This story is set during the first Jewish revolt of 70 AD. The Jews, which in this case means Second Temple Jews revolting against Roman rule, not Second Temple Jews who are trying to stay out of that revolt. For some reason, the Jews who ran the Jerusalem Jesus Club heard a warning, maybe it was from Jesus himself or an angel or something, a saint, heard a warning and then heeded that warning and left Jerusalem and found refuge in the city of Pella. Another writer who also recorded this event, Epiphanius, said it was Jesus who told them to leave. The incident is recorded in these two ancient sources, Eusebius of Caesarea's church history, and then Epiphanius of Salamis's Panarion. Eusebius was writing in the late 3rd century, and Epiphanius was writing in the late 4th century. The book of Revelation, which was likely written in the aftermath of the destruction of Jerusalem in and around 70 AD, may have some shrouded reference to this event as well. But really, everything is completely shrouded in Revelation. Also, the historicity of this event is highly debated. There has been significant archaeology done in and around Pella. Nothing conclusive has come out of the digs, such as, hey guys, this is where somebody writing on the wall, this is the location of the flight to Pella. Nothing like that. But there's some circumstantial evidence that would support that Pella would have been a great place to find refuge from the goings-ons in Jerusalem. It was on the other side of the Jordan and in the Decapolis, which these areas were not actively in revolt. 
or under attack at the time. There's a lot of caves and tunnels in this area, great places to hide. The Biblical Archaeological Review magazine has a few articles written by archaeologists working this area. They're great places to get more information if you're interested. There's also evidence that an Edenite or Jewish Christian community resided in Pella even at this early date. The Jerusalem Jesus Club may not have exactly been Edenite, but they were very similar in outlook to the Edenites. If there was, in fact, a group that called themselves the Edenites, that's a different story. But just a short word on this. I don't like the term Jewish Christians, especially used at this point in the first century A.D. Given the whole point of this series is to look at the development of the earliest of Christianities, it's worth a moment to discuss. All Christians at this point would have been under the broad umbrella of Second Temple Judaism. What would have differentiated a Christian from a Jew or a Jew from a Christian? It depends on what Christian and what Jew. By backdating our modern conception of Jew and Christian to what was going on in the later part of the first century AD just doesn't make sense. And this is a problem I found that top academics in the field do people who I highly respect and and I know that they know infinitely more than I could ever conceive about this topic, but they, they clearly make a blindside error on this topic of backdating the idea of Jew, modern Jewishness and modern Christianity to the people living at this time period. It could be political correctness. It could be a lot of reasons for that problem that they're causing in studying this time period. They're not looking at the people standing in their time, sits and labor, and they're looking, they're post-dating something onto those people. It's clear there was a wide diversity of thought in Second Temple Judaism and different centers of thought, so much so that these different groups that even under the umbrella of Second Temple Judaism could really be considered different religions that it some groups agreed with each other on some things and then radically disagreed with a group. And you could draw those lines of connection and then radical difference. Maybe somebody can draw up a chart like that. But the key point is they would have all been considered Second Temple Jews at this very, very earliest time. Maybe some of those like the Jesus Club people were viewed in a certain way because they found that Christ was in some way elevated. And in that some way elevated, there was a wide variety of belief. But in the end, the flight to Pella could have helped Christianity survive the great Jewish revolt. It could have also started widening the gap between the early Christians and the other Second Temple Jewish groups. The Christian clubs may have been been seen as not team players and that they were off just trying to save their own skins instead of fighting the hated Romans. Those early Jesus clubs could have saw the Roman just absolute devastation of the various Jewish towns as the coming of the apocalypse. And when you get down to brass tacks, not every Jew necessarily hated the Romans. I could see the flight or the idea of the flight as one of the things that helped hold together Paul's version of Christianity and Peter and James's version of Christianity. They had common purpose to not get destroyed by the Romans. That allowed them to maybe hammer out some of their differences and kept the movement unified, at least for a time. And if we think about it, this is about the time when the books of Acts and the Council of Jerusalem, even though the Council of Jerusalem would have taken place earlier in time than this, you could see that it could have been at least the narrativization of the Council of Jerusalem could have been influenced by a time period where The different uh, clans of Christianity, the different tribes or sects, you want to say it, of the earliest Christianity had to stick together and hang together 
or as Benjamin Franklin said, we either hang together or surely we'll hang separately. Again, this is a huge topic, but I thought it was worth a little time to discuss. Pella continued to thrive, but like so many other of the Decapolis cities, trade dried up. Natural disasters and the Muslim invasion eventually took the city down. One last city to go, and that is Damascus. Damascus is another ancient city that goes back to, at the very least, Egyptian times. As far as Christianity is concerned, Damascus is one of the most important major cities outside of Jerusalem, especially for early Christianity and for Second Temple Judaism, I might add. It is mentioned many times in the Old Testament, going back as far as pre-Abraham name change Abram originally in Genesis times. Almost every major book of the Old Testament has some mention of Damascus in it. Saul of Tarsus became Paul on his way to Damascus. Damascus would become a major center for early Christianity. The Cathedral of St. John the Baptist in Damascus would eventually become the Great Mosque of Damascus, which is still extant today. It's a thriving building and one of the most important pilgrimage places for Muslims. And you can see the clear stamp of a Roman classical, typical classical Roman cathedral on it. Put that one on the list as well for the tour. Oh, can I get your attention for just a second? A great way to support the History of the Papacy podcast is by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. Your support on Patreon goes a long way to help keep the history of the papacy sustainable for a long time in the future. There are four tiers of support on Patreon, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. Each of these tiers represents one of the traditional patriarchates of early Christianity. There are many great benefits for supporting the show on Patreon. The most important, though, is being included on the history of the papacy diptychs. In traditional Christianity, the diptychs are the list of bishops commemorated in their order of precedence. The sooner you sign up on Patreon, the higher you will be on the lists of the History of the Papacy patrons. Damascus was the first major jumping off point for the earliest Christians. This was because Damascus was very cosmopolitan, had a very big Greek influence, and was central in location. It was a nexus point to connecting the southern Levant to the northern Levant into Anatolia and was the major jumping off point to deeper into the Mesopotamia complex of trading systems. Antioch was more important politically and probably had a larger population during the Roman period. That's one of the big reasons why the Bishop of Antioch became a patriarch. Antioch was also a very early jumping off point for the Christian movement, but Damascus eclipsed Antioch as time went by. In the Islamic period, Damascus became the focus because of how con- how much it connected east to west. Antioch faded, and even the patriarchate of Antioch moved to Damascus. Damascus, for many reasons, never faded out like so many other of the Decapolis cities. Damascus was unique among almost all ancient cities that it survived to the present day as an important city. It was, it's been fairly much important throughout its entire history. You can't say that for many cities. That doesn't mean its history has always been rosy. There was a really devastating war in the early 20-teens, 2014, 2016, in that area. But despite that, Damascus is still a really important and populous city. It's the capital of the modern-day country of Syria, and it's it's starting to build up again, even though it was fairly well destroyed but it's it's too important to just lay there for a long time. It's going to get up and find greatness again. Still, Damascus is a bit of an outsider to the Decapolis because it's so far away from the other Decapolis cities. 
it would have been a good several day horse ride from the closest to Decapolis City and probably the better part of a week for a slow moving caravan. Damascus would have served as a great end point to the Decapolis system, though. I, I think Damascus to the north, Philadelphia to the south, set up as a sort of old school anchor stores in the mall. Sort of the Sears and the J.C. Pennies, they could funnel in the trade from in Damascus's case from all those points in the north, and then into Mesopotamia, especially that northern section of Mesopotamia. All that trade could have would have flowed into Damascus, Philadelphia to the south. All that trade coming up from the Arabian Peninsula and even all the way off into India and even really China, funnel in through the south, they circulate through the Decapolis cities and then funnel their way to the Mediterranean coast. Let's wrap things up for this overview of the Decapolis cities. I'll revisit my last point about Damascus and Philadelphia and getting trade goods into the empire. Trade and trade routes made the Decapolis. The Decapolis, in a lot of ways, made Christianity. That is a bold statement, I think. But trade routes and cities were the killer app of Christianity to borrow a phrase that I have borrowed many times from the historian Neil Ferguson. Trade and cities were the way that Christianity spread in the ancient world. It still is. Christianity moved along trade routes, spreading like a virus. And I mean that in the very best way. It was a a viral phenomenon. It just, it would move from one place to the next and it would catch and people would really grab onto it. And then they would move on to the next place because they were often travelers and it spread in a networked viral way. It spread all around the Roman world. Then it started to spread all around the Persian world to a lesser degree, but it sure did spread, and it spread exactly in the same way. I think the idea of the Decapolis must have had an influence on early Christianity as well. The idea of independent cities working together, but also competing against each other, but still feeling that they're a part of this league, having internal in- independence, but also being under the umbrella of a larger organization. These political and social functions allowed these cities to thrive. The idea of cities being independent with the bishop in charge, but being under the larger umbrella of the church allowed Christianity to expand rapidly and thrive as well. It was networks, and networks are so, so very important. And I plan on doing a bonus episode on networks because I think understanding how networks work will speak volumes to how Christianity works. Probably in networks for any major religion is how Christianity moved, and it was through networks. You really can't say the same thing about Islam or even early Judaism, or for most part, that's just not how religions work. They didn't spread. Ideas spread through networks. Like I said, look for a bonus episode on that because I find it fascinating. The Decapolis wasn't unique in being a set of city-states in a league, but what makes it special for us, at least, is how it fostered the earliest of Christianities. This little series inside of a series on the Decapolis grew to much more than I intended it to be, but it really does reinforce the themes of this, this 10th anniversary series. I have more episodes for this series. I want to explore just a few more elements of the development of early Christianity coming out of Second Temple Judaism. There is so much more I want to explore, but we have to wrap up at some point. In the future, look for just a quick series on a really early development that majorly influenced early Christianity. It's also a series that that came out of the Patreon community. So if you want to have a lot more say on how episodes and series develop, join over on Patreon. It really helps me out, especially during these times where I'm struggling to get episodes out with 
all the stuff that happens in real life, or at least quote unquote real life, what you might want to call it, with work and with doing house repairs after the deluge. That's what I'm calling this as the year of deluge is Patreon and the just the support, not just the monetary support, but also the the emotional support and the spiritual support that comes through Patreon really helps me charge through this. So after that short series, what's next? Here's some ideas, and this is kind of the, this one is leading the charge, the Catholic Church in American history, the later Middle Ages, the popes of that kind of weird age in between the Counter-Reformation and the Age of Enlightenment. Something else, let me know. I listen to, respect, and value all of your ideas, so let me hear them so that you get your, put your stamp on the history of the papacy. I'm not kidding either about that idea of a Decapolis tour. This That could happen if that's something you're interested in, so reach out. There's even more Decapolis coming. Join me in the next few episodes where I talk again with Scott McAndless of the Retelling the Bible podcast and Gary Stevens of the History in the Bible podcast about these one of these great stories of the Bible that will have a lot to do with the Decapolis. So I'll talk to you next time. Before we go, let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the history of the papacy diptychs. We have, at the Alexandria level, Roberto, William B., Brian, Christina, Alex, Augustus, Judy, and Max. At the Constantinople level, we have Dapo, Paul, Justin, Lana, John, Steve, and Sean, who are all magnificent and reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the Sea of Rome. We have Peter the Great, Amma the Great, Jeffrey the Great, Frederick the Great, and Jim the Great. With that, I hope you've enjoyed this piece of the mosaic of the history of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. 